Welcome to the lecture on sustainability challenges in the global steel cycle. The steel industry is one of the world's largest industrial sectors, with a global output of almost 2 billion tons of steel per year. And due to its magnitude, it has a number of sustainability challenges and you can read about them in the sustainable steel brochures that are published regularly by the World Steel Association, which is the steel industry's lobby organization. And the main sustainability challenge is hidden on page 3 of their reports, which is the CO2 emissions of that sector. The steel industry alone is responsible for between 7 and 9% of all man-made CO2 emissions. And due to that magnitude, the greenhouse gas emissions reduction is their main sustainability challenge for that industry. It's not their only challenge, but it's the dominant one. And we want to understand how this transformation towards a low carbon steel sector can happen and what co-benefits with other sustainable development goals exist and what challenges exist. In general, we can say that a quarter of global energy use goes into material production. The major materials that we produce mass-wise are cement, steel, plastics, and then come some other metals like aluminium and copper. The problem with many of these emissions is that they are difficult and costly to mitigate. One example is the steel industry. The major production road for steel from natural resources from iron ore is the blast furnace. Blast furnace uses coal or coke as a reduction agent, so that's fossil carbon, to then extract the oxygen from the iron ore, form carbon dioxide and liquid iron. This process cannot easily be electrified, so the option of just using low carbon electricity is not directly available. And that means the steel industries has larger challenges than other industries in reducing their carbon emissions. And we will see later what options actually exist. The high demand for steel is another main driver of greenhouse gas emissions in the steel industry. We illustrate the challenge of steel demand here by comparing the stocks of materials in the high income countries and the low income countries. But here we do not account for the materials themselves, but for the embodied emissions in those materials. So we plot the CO2 emissions that were emitted to build up all the material stocks that we use today for cement, for steel and for aluminium. And we see that Historically, the uh, high-income countries, which are shown as red here, have on average built up material stocks in their cities and infrastructure that caused about 50 tons of CO2 for their production. And we see that the lower-income countries, there is for example China and India, as countries with large population, have much lower material stocks today and thus also much lower embodied emissions in these stocks. But if we now expect that the entire world population at some point will enjoy the lifestyle of the people in the high-income countries, then they will need a lot of materials to do that. More cities, more living space, more infrastructure. And those materials will need CO2 for their production, will cause CO2 emissions. And these CO2 emissions here are visualized by the blue area in the background. So these would be the CO2 emissions if we were supplied the entire world population with the material stocks of the high income countries, plus 2 billion yet unborn people by which the world population will grow by 2050. Overall, expanding the material stocks to high income country level at the global scale by 2050 would cause another 350 billion tons of CO2. This is roughly a third of the remaining carbon budget and since time is running it's probably much less right now than when this plot was made. So we see with current technology and increasing urbanization at the global scale we have a huge sustainability challenge here for producing the materials and steel in particular. So where does the steel come from? There's two major routes for making steel. There's primary production and there's secondary production. These are jargon terms and they mean that a material can either be produced from natural resources like ores, iron ores, that's primary production, or from secondary resources and that is steel scrap. 
This we call secondary production. Overall, we have now a production volume globally of around 1,900 million tons every year, of which roughly two-thirds are primary production and one-third is recycled steel. We cannot recycle much more because we first have to build up steel stocks in the different countries. This is why we need all the primary material. We need it to feed the increasing urban steel stocks in China, for example, in Africa and many other places. And because of the high demand for steel and the difficulty to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions in the steel sector and other material producing industries, we can now say that emissions from material production are a bottleneck to curbing global warming to 2 degrees Celsius or below. There are other sectors like buildings and transports that are in large parts relatively easy to decarbonize with low carbon electricity, but this does not directly hold for material production and especially for the steel industry. So what we need to do from a science perspective, we really need to think about sustainability in the steel industry from a more broad perspective, including also the use of steel, the recycling in the future, material efficiency, like can we extract more services from less steel and so on. So we will have to apply a systems perspective to not only focus on individual steel making technologies, but really about steel demand, production and recycling from a more aggregate and comprehensive perspective. We will do this by looking at sustainable material cycles and sustainable steel from four different system levels. The first level is the process level. So we can look at individual processes like the blast furnace or the electric arc furnace or a car and see what can we do here. What can we do in terms of process efficiency, energy demand, energy carrier, material content, recyclability and so on. So a lot of course can be done for products that contain steel and for the processes that use the steel or process it. But that won't be enough because of the high demand. So we go one step up to the process cluster level where we can ask ourselves, okay, now we have an energy consuming process, but maybe there's a lot of waste heat that we can use otherwise. So we can, in a process cluster, have some industrial symbiosis to actually overall save energy or materials. One example is that we can use the slag from blast furnaces as a substitute for cement clinker. So this is widely used and helps, of course, to reduce emissions in the cement industry and thus overall emissions. A third system perspective is then the supply chain and material cycle perspective. So we're not looking just at one material or one product being there, but we want to understand how does the product evolve over time? How is it used? How is it recycled? How is the ratio between recycled steel and new steel, like primary steel? Where does the steel come from? So all these perspectives we can put together in this supply chain material cycle perspective to understand not only the steel use in one product, but across several product life cycles. Finally, the system level perspective where we need to ask ourselves, okay, how much steel do we actually need in different societies at different development stages? And how can this steel then be supplied sustainably? We will apply certain principles to look at these different system levels to turn this whole thing into a scientific endeavor. The first principle to analyze steel from a systems perspective is the service stock flow nexus. This is a certain perspective of looking at the system. At the core of the stock flow nexus are, as the name says, the stocks. Here the idea is that it is the stocks of materials that provide the services. When you are tired and want to sleep, you don't buy a bed. You already have a bed. Hence, you make use of an already existing stock of products and materials to provide the service to you. And since most of steel products are long-lived, virtually all steel provides the service not as produced steel, but as steel in stocks. The homes, the buildings, the cars, the infrastructure. From these stocks, we extract the services like shelter, mobility, or transformation, transportation. 
and the stocks need energy to operate, for example gasoline to drive the vehicle, so the property of the stocks determines how much energy you need to extract a certain service unit. And the lifetime of the stocks determine how frequently you have to replace them, so it determines how often you can recycle and how often you need new materials to keep the stock in function. So service stock flow nexus couples service provision to the size of the stocks of materials, to the energy needed to operate the stocks and to the materials needed to build up and maintain the stocks. An example here of this principle is the scenario modeling for future steel use. Once we understand that steel use is not determined by the steel production but by the steel stocks, we consequentially can argue that a future scenario for steel use should be stock based. So we will look at how much steel in use do we need in different countries and how could it evolve in the future. On the left side here in this plot you see the steel stock curves in different countries and you see that there's actually saturation. So apparently once a country is in a high income range you need a certain amount of steel per person between 10 and 14 tons roughly but not more. This is the steel in the buildings, in the infrastructure, in the vehicles, and so on. So again, it's not the steel produced per year or consumed per year that determines the service level, but the steel that's in the products, sometimes for decades or centuries. Now, we can extrapolate these steel stock curves into the future, assuming eventually, as in the graph shown before, the whole world and the different world regions will saturate at the same per capita stock level, but of course at different times. China will saturate earlier because they have a large construction activity and steel industry operating right now, but regions like India or Sub-Saharan Africa will come later. And then if we add these per capita steel stocks curve together after multiplying them with the respective future population, we end up at an average per capita steel stock curve here shown on the right side where we assume in this saturation scenario that steel stocks will slowly continue to grow at the global level on average. Most of the steel is of course in construction but some is also in machinery, transportation and products. And we will now see how we can use those future steel stock scenarios and convert them into production scenarios. How much steel do we need to produce to actually maintain and build up these stock scenarios. To make these calculations we apply the second principle of modeling steel from a systems perspective and that's in-use stock dynamics. An in-use stock is a process where you consume something, use it for a while and dispose of it later. Modeled here as such a symbol, a process with an input-output flow and a stock in the middle. The first equation we use to model such a process is the lifetime model. What is shown here, and we have more specific lectures on that, so that's only a course overview, is that we calculate the future outflow from historic inflow using such a lifetime distribution as it's shown on the left side here, sorry, on the right side here. So we will have a steel unit being consumed in one year and then after let's say five years some of the steel will leave the stock on average and then we have a peak after let's say eight years and some late comers of this age cohort and eventually all the originally consumed steel stock will have left the stock and be sent to the recycling and waste management hopefully. At any given time we can create or establish the use phase mass balance that says everything that goes into the use phase either leaves it again in the same period or accumulates as stock. That's the same as the mass balance of your fridge or your stock of heating or of wood, firewood in the basement and everything else. It also applies to steel. Finally, we have the system mass balance of the entire steel cycle that says everything that's produced so that comes from natural resources either compensates for the losses at different stages of the system or it also contributes to expanding the stocks. And we will now illustrate those equations with empirical data. Here you see again the mass balance of the use phase 
And the ratio of stock expansion over inflow is shown here over time for a number of different countries. You see here, this is the top curves with the red colors that they are countries where between 95 and 99 percent of all steel inflow, so the steel consumption, is actually put into stock expansion. So these are the countries that rapidly expand their building stock and their infrastructure. China, India, Iran, Indonesia, Egypt. So we know that the steel they consume is actually not replacing old buildings, but going into new buildings. We have countries with intermediately mature steel stocks like Brazil, Italy or Turkey. And there the ratio of stock expansion now is between 40 and 80%. So that means still around, let's say, 60% of the steel consumed goes into expanding the stock. The other 40% go into replacing old buildings. And then we have the blue curves countries with mature steel stocks, where most of the steel actually goes into maintaining the stock. So it's not stock expansion, but it is stock replacement. Two countries, Germany and Japan, even have negative curves, meaning that overall their steel stocks are shrinking. A second perspective is the system perspective on what happens with the total primary production. So the system mass balance tells you that everything that comes from nature, the primary production, must either compensate for losses or also go into stock expansion, new buildings, new cities, new infrastructure. And we see here historically actually most of the primary production goes into stock expansion because we have seen a huge increase in urban fabric over the last century. Roughly 20 to 30 percent of the primary production go into compensating losses. And in a circular economy, actually, if it's perfectly circular, both terms would be zero. There would be no losses and no stock expansion. And you can see here how far we are from that vision of the circular economy in the steel cycle, because we do have losses, but more importantly, we need more steel to provide the different regions of the world with more infrastructure and more buildings. The third principle of describing the steel cycle from a system perspective is a mass balance material cycle modeling. So before we had principles for individual processes and the use phase, but now we put it all together. Here we want to not only understand how long steel is used and how much scrap comes out in the end, but we want to calculate the split between secondary and primary production, we want to study the impact of different production routes on total energy consumption. We want to maybe even understand quality issue, like for example, how many tramp elements enter the steel in the recycling processes and then cause trouble later on. All this can be done with a proper mass balanced model of an entire material cycle and of course the steel cycle in particular. An important question for this kind of modeling is at what level of detail it should be done. There's two extremes. The left extreme is the so-called aggregate demand modeling that's often applied in integrated assessment modeling, so the big computer models of more or less everything that produce climate scenarios. There, material cycles often are not studied explicitly, but instead there is a function that directly translates a GDP scenario for the future into industrial energy use. But that's not very helpful if you want to actually understand how much materials we need and what exactly we can do to make the material use more climate friendly and so on. On the other side, we have the engineering models with really detailed depiction of every single process step in the steel industry or other metal industries with a lot of parameters, a lot of data input needed. Now, for the purpose that we want to do here, or we want to study, which is the, let's say, big picture sustainability transition of the material cycles, both perspectives are not perfect. Instead, we choose a compromise. The compromise that we have chosen in material flow analysis says that we do have aggregate process representations, like the ones shown here for different production steps. So we are neither as aggregate as on the left side, nor as detailed as on the right side, but we are in between to get the main steel processing steps right. But to connect ourselves to more detailed modeling, we allow 
for mass balance for all relevant chemical elements individually. So we don't have the total mass, but the different processes that we model are balanced for iron, for carbon, for copper, and so on. So there we can have a consistency at the element level. So what can we do with such kind of modeling? First, we can calculate, as one example, the lifetime of steel in the technosphere. Here we assume that the steel cycle will be operated as today also in the future. And then we can have a long time horizon and see that whenever we insert a certain amount of steel today, here one ton, it will gradually decline. It will decline because we have losses in collection of old products, we have losses in remelting and also losses in recycling. And if we integrate over these curves here, these decay curves of the steel, we arrive at an average lifetime of 250 to 300 years for a long-lived material like steel. That's, I would say, actually quite short, because the climate impacts of the steel production originally will stay there for longer than these three centuries. We can also model how the steel life tank could be extended by having a more better building life, having better recycling or better cross-cycling, for example, from buildings into vehicles and vice versa, we could, in the most optimistic scenario, extend the lifetime of steel until 560 years, which is considerably better, but still not anywhere near an infinite lifetime that we could envision for a circular economy. So again, you see how far away we are from this ideal notion or idealistic notion of a perfectly circular material cycle. In fact, we use many of our materials quite inefficiently. In different recycling loops, the losses accumulate. I have losses in sorting, in collecting and in remelting. And one major way of reducing these losses is to avoid remelting of metals, so no oxidation in the remelting step, but use or reuse the scrap or the old material without remelting. We will see later how this could work. Now let's move back from the examples to the big picture of the global steel cycle. Previously, we showed that we can convert the regional per capita steel stock curves into a global average per capita steel stock curve. Now we use modeling principle 2, which is the in use stock dynamics, to convert the future per capita steel stock into the inflow of new steel that we need to expand and maintain the stock, and on the right side, the outflow of steel scrap from the use phase. And we do this using a mathematical operation that's called inverse convolution. And for more detail, please then check the papers linked in this lecture. So we have a given steel stock and from that we calculate how much steel we need to build up that steel stock and maintain it. And also how much scrap we can generate. Now, once we have such a scenario for future steel demand and scrap supply, we can make the mass balance and calculate how much we can recycle and we could say, well, the rest needs to come from primary production. If we do that and also add energy consumption and emission, you won't be surprised if I tell you, when I tell you that the result we find is that this scenario is not sustainable in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. It's too much steel and the present technology is not fit to actually bring down emissions substantially. We need more and different solution. So before we do our scenario calculations, we expand the picture a bit and include material efficiency in the climate change mitigation picture. So we want to understand how we can use materials more efficiently, meaning using less material per service delivered to reduce the demand for steel in the different process steps and overall to dematerialize and thus also decarbonize the service provision. What strategies do we have? In vehicles, actually quite many of them. It starts from the material choice, so we could use high strength materials or maybe aluminium to have lighter vehicles. We can of course work with the vehicle size, so same service provided by smaller and thus lighter vehicles. We can share the vehicles, thus reduce the total fleet size. We can expand their lifetimes. We can have a better manufacturing 
um, better scrap sorting and so on. And of course, we could have a better waste recovery, for example, better separation of the different waste streams in the vehicle recycling. In the building sector, we also have a number of strategies that fall into the same categories. So, of course, the material choice matters a lot. We could use timber buildings where possible. We can share the buildings, having a smaller living space or more efficient living space, like shared common spaces and so on. Lifetime expansion is a huge issue in buildings. And also the idea of having a more efficient construction process, so less construction waste. Material efficiency usually was a crisis issue. Here is some drastic example from World War II America that tells you to use your services, your products more efficiently, to not waste resources and to also not waste metal resources. Now we are using the same old story actually, but with a more positive turn and a more transformative perspective that we say we have a global challenge that we all need to master together and one of the leverages we have is actually to use the materials that are actually quite precious in a more efficient way to bring down energy use, resource use, greenhouse gas emissions while still providing high service levels to people all across the globe. So if we do that now, if we take our material cycle model put in the future steel stock demand scenario converted to inflow and outflow from the use phase and switch on all the different material strategies, material efficiency strategies, we arrive at the following picture. We see in a do nothing scenario, that's the baseline, which is here on top, the big uh, blue line. We see that over the next three decades, emissions in the steel industry will roughly stay stable around three gigatons per year. So they won't grow further, but we see that because uh, in China we expect a decline in steel consumption that's partly compensated for by expansion in other parts of the world, like India, Indonesia or Africa, that roughly primary steel production will stay constant over the next decades, meaning constant emissions, roughly. That's good. It's not a further increase, but it's not yet sustainable. If we compare the steel cycle emissions with the global average reduction that would be needed to reach certain climate target, we realize that constant emissions are still in a range of more than four degrees Celsius global warming. So of course we need to do more than that also in the steel industry because it's such a large sector. So we would switch on energy efficiency in the industry or material efficiency in the industry. That's the two blue wedges and you see you can save maybe 500 million tons per year of CO2. That's already something, but nothing to get you really into the sustainable range. Only if you really consider the different material efficiency strategies at the end use side, the product light weighting, the lifetime extension, and most importantly, the more intense use of products, so car sharing and more intense use of building space, you see that steel demand can be reduced a lot and so energy use and emissions can be reduced a lot. And in the most optimistic scenario, from a material efficiency and climate point of view, you can go down to only half a gigaton of CO2 emissions in that major industrial sector and this would actually be something that is in the range of the 2 degrees Celsius climate target. Now this was a rough overview of what can be done in the steel cycle in principle. The major shortcoming of this analysis is that it uses a very abstract quantity which is the amount of steel per person. But nobody cares about the amount of steel per person. Instead, we care about the services, the transport, the living, the working, the leisure. So in the next step, we would like to open up the black box of steel stocks and rather determine the necessary steel stocks from the different service levels. So we link well-being, human well-being to service like shelter, mobility, communication, and then calculate using different intensity of use parameters the necessary product stocks to deliver those services. And once we have the product stocks, we can then calculate, as we did before, the material content. We can calculate the material inflow and outflow that's needed to expand and maintain those product stocks and the energy demand and emissions. So this 
more detailed sophisticated approach is now being applied to different countries and here i want to show you an example for three major sector namely vehicles residential and non-residential buildings for germany in this country those three sectors and their associated energy material supply account for roughly 50 percent of domestic greenhouse gas emissions currently if we switch on energy efficiency and future population growth and service growth and also low carbon energy supply we can reduce those emissions substantially in the left figure you see here we can go down from currently 400 megatons in these three sectors down to 80 so that is actually an 80 percent reduction that is a lot but won't be enough if we really want to become carbon neutral which is one of the policy goals we have for climate change so we need to do more and it's no surprise that material efficiency can help you achieve higher reductions and actually the emissions reduction potential that we find for the different material efficiency strategies the higher yields the downsizing the ride sharing and so on is quite evenly distributed across the entire spectrum so in 2050 after we decarbonize the energy supply and have a lot of energy efficiency we can still save 50 percent of remaining emissions from material efficiency that's the message here for this particular scenario and even in cumulative emissions which are less sensitive to rapid changes we still can save almost one-fifth the changes are more drastic in the supporting material cycles so the plot i showed you before was the use phase and energy supply for heating and driving and material production and now it's only material production and their material efficiency could save 75 percent of remaining emissions and remember these are the emissions that are difficult to decarbonize and by using materials more efficiency we reduce throughput and output of this industry which automatically of course leads to lower energy demand and thus lower emissions and cumulative emissions could be reduced by roughly half now this is not a good message if your business model is to continue business as usual producing a lot of steel a lot of cement it doesn't work we need to redesign our entire material cycles we need to rethink our understanding of why and what for we need materials if we want to go for deep decarbonization carbon neutrality material efficiency can get you a long way that is the message here it also shows you how it would work in individual sectors so the material related greenhouse gas emissions for passenger cars are the greenhouse gases for producing steel aluminium plastics glass and recycling it and you see those emissions will go down anyway because of ongoing decarbonization mostly of energy supply from roughly 10 megatons now to maybe six but if you also have efficiency in industry higher yields if we reuse and lifetime extend the vehicle components and if you start using the cars more efficiently so having fewer cars on the street you can go down from six megatons to maybe three so this is the additional 50 percent reduction for passenger cars and the reduction is more drastic for residential buildings because there the big contribution comes from the more intense use of buildings so we would actually be able to save a lot of the new construction if we were able to use existing building space in a smarter way again this is no good news to the construction material and construction industry but it is a possibility that we add to the spectrum of emissions mitigation strategies we also want to understand how material efficiency fits into the big picture what we do here is we take different socioeconomic scenarios like for future service level and population development and show how we can decarbonize them deeply by first switching on the energy efficiency that would be the green reduction bar from the baseline then the low carbon energy supply the blue component and then the red components are the different material efficiency strategies in the use phase that means more intense use and also in the industry and you can see here if you really want to go into deep decarbonization, you add 
you gain a lot of extra potential by considering material efficiency next to efficiency and low carbon energy supply. And the remaining emissions in those scenarios, the gray bars here, the residual emissions, they could be compensated for with negative emissions technologies, for example. So this was a big picture overview of steel demand and supply in the future. And we see that we have many different leverage points on the demand side and also on the industry side to bring down steel use in total and also energy use and emissions. Towards the end of this lecture, I want to become a bit more detailed again and single out individual processing steps and talk a bit of what can be done here. No matter how efficient we are with the steel use in the future, it's clear that we for foreseeable time will need more primary production to feed the expansion demand in the different developing regions of the world. The question is, what technologies should we use to produce steel from iron ore? And the answer to that question changes over time. What you see here is an already 12 year old analysis done back in 2008 when two main strategies were politically deemed viable. First, carbon capture and storage, CCS, and second, use of bioenergy. And no surprise, you see in this graph that these technologies will partly take over. Now today, the situation has changed a lot. We know that a, biofuels have a lot of own impact, especially when they're associated with land use change, and B, they're very scarce at the global level. And second, carbon capture and storage is A, very expensive, and B, doesn't seem to be acceptable or feasible in many world regions. So we need to find other strategies to decarbonize primary steel production. And what is now on the horizon is hydrogen-based steel. The idea is, that we now have very cheap solar based electricity from photovoltaics that can be used in an electrolysis process to produce hydrogen. The hydrogen could serve as a reduction agent instead of the coke or the coal. Now this is possible in principle, but the technology to actually use hydrogen at a large scale still needs to be developed and scaled up. And hydrogen is one of the most expensive energy carriers because of the many losses involved in its production. So technically this could be a viable option, but it will be very expensive. And this means the business case for using loss steel, sorry, less steel is actually improved. So material efficiency probably will play a larger role in the future than we anticipate today, simply because it will be very expensive to decarbonize primary steel production. So how can we promote or incentivize the more efficient use of materials? There are different strategies. There's, for example, eco-design directives that could stipulate certain material efficiency solutions, there is also economic instruments, and this is what I want to briefly focus on now. You can say that by not paying the true price of carbon emissions, we subsidize a material and emissions intensive lifestyle. So the solution to the pollution, so to say, here is to tax in some form or the other the emissions of material production to then overall make the materials more expensive so that there is a price signal for using them more efficiently. And one of the instruments to do that is emissions trading in a so-called cap and trade system. I don't want to go into the details now, that would be too long for this lecture, but the basic idea is that there is a system where you have the total amount of CO2 given by policymakers and then you have a trade of emissions permit that correspond to your actual emissions at market prices. Sounds very good. In principle, it's very effective. In practice, it has several challenges. One of them is, globally, we don't have such a system. We have sub-regions of the world, like the EU has one, California has one for electricity and so on. China is now starting one for electricity too. But there is no global carbon market, no global carbon price. And that means that industries whose products are prone to import and export fear that if they in one region have to pay the full carbon price, 
they will just go bankrupt and instead people will buy materials from outside the region. So we have the situation, for example, in the EU emissions trading system that some industry get large parts of the emissions permit for free. And, no surprise, the cement and steel industries are among them. Because they would say, if we have to pay for our emissions at a full price level, we are not competitive anymore with steel from China, for example. And the policymaker said, okay, yeah, that's probably true. So you get some of your emission certificates for free. That's called free allocation. But if you don't pay for your emissions in emissions trading system, the whole system is kind of pointless. So as we go to more ambitious emissions reduction, these free allocations will be reduced and need to be compensated for by so-called border adjustment mechanisms. So in some form or another, whenever there's an import to or export from the EU or in other regions, the carbon value of these products will have to be charged or kind of documented in some way. There are just different options documented here in the reference. I don't want to go into detail now, but I want to show you what is the impact of actually adding the full carbon price to the different materials. So here we melt calculations for a carbon price of 30 euros per ton of CO2. Current price is about 25 euros per ton, so it's not that unrealistic to have soon 30. And we see that there is a price change for steel of 8%, aluminium 19%, some plastics about 2%. If we propagate those price changes into a consumer product here, a car, we see that finally the price change at the consumer level will be less than 1%. And the reason is that you accumulate a lot of value added in the component manufacturer, the final manufacturer. So the material price as share of the total product price declines as you move up the value chain. So the final consumer sees a relatively small price increase because the share of material value in a product value is at this high level of manufacturing also relatively small. It's roughly between 3 and 6%. The rest, 95%, are value-added labor costs and other costs that have accrued along the value chain. But the final consumer is not the main target of this carbon charge because the final consumer doesn't have a material choice anyway. He or she can only buy different products. The material choice lies with the component manufacturers. They see the materials, they have a choice whether or not an engine block is made of steel or aluminium or a car seat is made of this or that material, plastics or aluminium, for example. So we want to make sure that you have reasonably strong price signals at the component manufacturer. So in this calculation, the price change for a gearbox manufacturer would be about 1%, for a car seat manufacturer about 4%. Now that doesn't look like so much either, but keep in mind that the margins in the car component manufacturer are very low. So this price change can already put one company out of business if they don't have a more material efficient choice, so compensating for these price changes. The story here is that by reducing this free emissions certificate allocation, we can reinstall the price signals for material efficiency at the component manufacturing level as one out of many different strategies to actually install material efficiency in the industrial system. So we have now taken a very long journey through the different elements of the steel cycle and the different leverage points we have for emissions reduction or more intense use of steel. There's much more to talk about and much more to do. So here I just give now finally a quick outlook on what can be done with this type of research and what is also already on the way. It's of course interesting to add the cost layer to such efforts to actually compare the supply side mitigation cost with the demand side mitigation cost, for example, of buying an electric vehicle. It's interesting to also not only look at buildings and vehicles, but also at infrastructure or industrial processes. 
it's interesting to not only look at the material demand from individual sectors, but actually scale up these exercises to capture the total demand to then also say something about total recycling. Finally, it's interesting to also link the scenarios we describe here for service provision to scenarios of future urban or maybe low carbon lifestyles and to study the different material cycles and their exchange of tramp or alloying elements in greater detail. So a lot is there to do to actually get a more detailed and refined picture of what is possible in future material cycles. We can imagine that the material futures in the f will look different than we have today and the tools we have at hand can help us to get a glimpse of how sustainable metal cycles and the steel cycle in particular may actually look like. Thank you.